In Revelations chapters 2 and 3, there are seven letters directly from Jesus written to seven ancient churches that were located in the nation now known as Turkey. Do these letters form a prophecy, the prophecy of the seven churches of Revelation, or were they just a series of letters on how to live the Christian life, like many of the epistles? And if they are a prophecy, however, what does the prophecy mean? How can we apply it? That's what we're talking about today, and we're starting right now. The overwhelming opinion of scholars today is that the letters are simply a group of ancient epistles that are good advice anytime on Christian living. But there are shocking details in the letters that make this theory impossible. For instance, in the letter to Thyatira, Jesus threatens to throw those who do not repent of the sin of Jezebel into the great tribulation. That's Revelation 2.22. Now, how is that possible if the letter was sent as advice to ancient Middle Eastern churches? Obviously, the Great Tribulation is a future event, even to our day. In the letter to the Church of Sardis, Jesus warns that if the people within this church don't wake up, he will come to them as a thief, Revelation 3.3. Jesus only comes as a thief to those still living at his return. And in the letter to the church of Pergamum, Jesus threatens those who don't repent that he will come to them soon and fight against them with the sword of his mouth. Revelation 2.16. Again, something that he does only at Armageddon. So even though many pastors long to teach about these letters as if they are just simple epistles, like the epistle to Ephesians or Philippians, they obviously are more than that. Instead, they seem directed at churchgoers who are alive in the end times, close to the return of Jesus. So maybe, just maybe, they are the secret instructions of Jesus to those who are living during the end times. Maybe the letters to the seven churches are a prophecy. If so, we need to decipher it as it will give us amazing information. The seven letters are a favorite part of Revelation for pastors to preach on. They do contain what is good advice for every era, past, present, and future. And they give pastors an easy way to preach out of Revelation without actually getting involved in all that prophecy stuff. Plus, they are the direct words of Jesus. But what if these letters are part of that prophecy stuff? If they are advice to Christians during the last days, well, knowing what they mean and what we should be doing and when we should be doing it is critically important, something that no one or practically no one is doing. And if our pastors are mistaken about this, they are leaving the church totally unprepared for what is to come. This is not a trivial issue. It is an age-defining issue issue. Let's say that again and let it sink in. I hear a lot of teachers say if the church was going to face the tribulation period, why didn't Jesus give us specific instructions on how to do it? The answer may well be that he did in plain sight in Revelation 2 and 3, but everyone is missing it. And if they are missing it, it is one of the greatest tragedies of all time in church history. We are missing the elephant in the room. But you do not have to miss this advice, this treasure. And in the next series of videos, we are going to first show why the letters to the seven churches are indeed future instructions, and then unpack them one by one to show what they mean. So let's start by considering the main theories about the seven churches right now. First, is a theory that they are simply letters to historic churches in the first century that are good advice even for us today. Second is the theory that these churches might represent either historic church eras or what some call church ages. Third, that these are end time churches, but that the letters are representative of church types now and during the end times. And finally, there is this theory the theory that the letters are sequential, 
that they represent Jesus' advice to the one and only Church of Jesus Christ, as it endures seven different events during the end times, specifically the seven seals. Okay, let's start by looking at the last chapter of Revelation and something that has puzzled scholars for 2,000 years. The God of the spirits of the prophets sent his angel to show his bondservants the things that must soon take place. And behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. So Jesus said Revelation was prophecy, that these things would soon take place, and that he was coming quickly, to which we ask, Really? Now, according to John's disciple, Polycarp, Bishop of Smyrna, John wrote Revelation during the reign of the Roman Emperor Domitian between 90 and 100 AD. So if Jesus was coming quickly then, in 90 AD, how is it that he hasn't come by now? <laughs> this is a super difficult question. In the early church, it wasn't much of a question. But as the years went by, church leaders began to ask, hey, where's Jesus? And some began to come up with theories to explain Jesus' statement. Theories like Revelation had already been fulfilled. Augustine, who lived in the fourth century, is behind a lot of those ideas that still persist today. We call them preterism or historicism. These theories believe that the prophecies of Revelation were fulfilled long ago. However, it should be pretty obvious that the prophecies in Revelation aren't fulfilled. Just read the book. A third of the earth was not burned with fire at the first trumpet. And demonic locusts did not sting all of the wicked for five months, having them cry out for death, but death would not come. That was the fifth trumpet. And a third of the population of the earth weren't killed by fire and brimstone of a sixth trumpet. These things obviously have not happened. But then, how do we explain Jesus' statement that he is coming soon? The answer is actually very easy. In the same chapter we read, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. Revelation was written for the churches, and when Jesus refers to the churches in this book, he means the seven churches. At the beginning of the book, Revelation says the same thing. Write a book, what you see, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. So, the book of Revelation was specifically written for these seven churches. And depending on how you interpret them depends on how you view Jesus' statement that he is coming quickly. If you think the letters are just historic, or if they represent church ages and history, then Jesus' statement about coming quickly might even be considered misleading. But... If you believe the seven churches are primarily about the end times during the last seven years, well, then that is a whole different story. Then Jesus' statement is completely accurate. He will be coming soon once the last seven years begin, won't he? So that is one major reason to believe the seven churches are end time only, not simply historic. But people ask, wait a minute, weren't the seven churches historic churches in Turkey in 90 AD? And the answer is absolutely they were. There is no doubt about it. They were only seven of the dozens of churches in Turkey in those days, and of the hundreds of churches worldwide that circled the Mediterranean. Places like Antioch, Alexandria, Thessalonica, Pontus, Galatia, Corinth, Heropolis, Colossae, Rome, Cyprus, and of course, Jerusalem itself. So why did Jesus address these epistles, these letters, to mostly smaller churches? In fact, Philadelphia was very small, rather than to the more major cities of his day. 
Some would say because, well, these were John's churches. In other words, John was the overseer of these seven churches. But some of the larger churches, like Colossae or Heropolis, were in the very next town to those smaller churches. So obviously, this choice of churches was for some other reason. John would have probably been the overseer of those other churches also. So maybe it was for symbolic or prophetic reasons. That doesn't prove a primary end-time connection just yet, but it at least proves Revelation was meant for more than just those seven churches, and they were probably chosen for what they symbolized. Those who hold this historic view that the letters to the seven churches were just good advice and were written just to those historic churches are usually surprised and puzzled after we answer these first two questions. There are also several places in Revelation where the translation of the Greek has been stretched to accommodate a view that the seven churches are only historic. Yes, I said stretched, and by almost all translators. Let's look at the verse, Revelation 22:16, that we looked at previously. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. Notice the footnote attached to the word for in your Bible. The reason there is a footnote is that the Greek word translated for doesn't mean for at all. It is the Greek word epi, which more properly means upon or about. The Young's literal translation is the only Bible translation that, in my opinion, translates this verse correctly as testify to you these things concerning the churches. Concerning the churches or about the churches? Wow, that changes everything about Revelation. So if all the things that happen in Revelation are actually concerning or about the seven churches, then the churches will exist in the future. And all the events in Revelation that we think don't involve these churches do involve these churches. Now, I can't answer for you why good-meaning Christian Bible translators would change a word that changes the whole meaning of the book of Revelation, but I think you should look at your Bible, look at the footnotes, see if what we're saying is correct, and then begin to have a more open mind to what the seven churches are about. However, this isn't the only place where a translation has altered the meaning of the seven churches. The second area where translators might have gotten a little bit too loose with Revelation is what many who think that the seven churches are simply historic consider their knockout punch. What about Revelation 119? Therefore, write the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place after these things. This passage is always interpreted as defining Revelation into three areas. First, the things which you have seen, which is Jesus' appearance, his unusual appearance, in chapter 1. The things that are, and by this they think it means the letters to the seven churches, which were things happening at the time of John, and then the things that will take place, meaning the future prophecy of the rest of the book. I bet that is exactly what you've been taught as well. And doesn't that part of the verse, the things that are, seem to imply that these letters are for only the historic churches? Now, I don't think anyone argues that the advice Jesus gave each church wasn't for that specific church. They were historic churches, and the advice was for them. But it can also be meant in a prophetic, symbolic sense, 
a dual fulfillment. So let's keep exploring that. Plus, the verse we are looking at, Revelation 119, actually can be translated in a slightly different way. And almost no one is aware of that. The phrase, the things that are, is ha-asin in the Greek, which if you translate it literally, means the things that they are. In fact, noted New Testament translator Henry Alford translated this as the things they signify. And Meyer's New Testament commentary mentions the exact same idea. The way your Bible and my Bible translates this phrase, however, isn't the only way to translate it as we just saw. And it probably is not the best way. However, that was the way that King James translated it in the 1600s. And that idea stuck and became tradition. And no major translation since has been willing to change the tradition because it dramatically changes our eschatology. However, if we look at the 159 other uses of Iseen in the New Testament, not one time is it translated the way your Bible translates Revelation 119. Not one other time. That should say something to us. The phrase, the things that are, found in your Bible and mine, is implied to mean the things that are currently existing. Currently existing is implied in the English. But is that true of the Greek? You would think that if this was a common Greek usage, that at least one or two other times in the entire New Testament, it would mean that same thing. But it doesn't. It never means that elsewhere in the Bible. This is probably pretty surprising to you that a fundamental theory of revelation, in fact, the one used to organize the whole book, might be mistaken. In fact, probably is mistaken. So I think we need to look at Alfred's literal translation of the phrase and see what Revelation 119 might really mean. If we pop Alfred's literal translation of the verse back in, it means something very different than what you've been taught. Therefore, write the things which you have seen and what they signify and the things that will take place after these things. Instead of three different time periods, the verse only implies two. Jesus' appearance and what each aspect of his appearance means like his eyes of flaming fire and the seven lampstands, etc. And then a second time period, the future prophetic aspect of the book of Revelation. But how does the context of Revelation 119 fit with this new translation? It fits perfectly. In fact, it fits much better. Because if we look at the very next verse, it seems to confirm Alfred and Meyer's translations. As for the mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. It, Jesus immediately begins to give meaning to the symbols. The lampstands are the seven churches and the stars are their angels. Jesus is showing what the aspects of his appearance in John's vision signify. So now we have just proved that there is no biblical evidence that the letters to the seven churches are strictly based on the past. So let's look at reasons the letters to the seven churches might apply to an end time period. First, the letters, as most interpret them, are grossly out of place in Revelation, which is about the end times. What is advice to seven local assemblies in the first century doing in an apocalyptic book? It's like a red M&M &M 
in a sea of blue ones. Second, the language used to write to these assemblies is distinctly apocalyptic, unlike any other epistle in the Bible. Symbolic language is used throughout, and some of the references mention specific end-time events. For instance, the letter to Thyatira mentions some of its members entering the Great Tribulation. <laughs> now that is only possible for those living in the end times, wouldn't you agree? Third, the order of Jesus' advice to these assemblies is not random, not at all, but it follows a distinct pattern that parallels what will happen during each of the seven seals. In other words, the first letter matches the first seal, the second, the second, the third, the third, etc. Now, this is a key understanding, which we're going to discuss in greater detail throughout this entire series on the seven churches. And when you work through the entire series, your eyes will open and you'll say, oh, wow, I see it now. As an example, remember, we mentioned the Great Tribulation as part of the fourth letter, the letter to Thyatira. Well, the fourth seal is believed to be about the very start of that Great Tribulation, the abomination of desolation. So even this aspect fits perfectly. And of course, as we've already seen, Revelation 22 says the book of Revelation is prophecy. So this must include the letters to the seven churches as well. So what about that church ages theory? That is a prophecy of sorts. Is it possible the letters are prophetic about various time periods in church history? Now this is a very, very, very popular view. First, I would ask, what is the reference to the Great Tribulation doing in the fourth church age long before the real great tribulation began the answer is usually well maybe it's a symbolic usage of that word a symbolic usage of a term great tribulation that only occurs three times in the new testament i don't think so second look at this statement from that same letter the letter to the church at thyatira nevertheless what you have, hold fast until I come. How is that possible for a church era that has long since passed and Jesus has not come? Makes no sense for this to be in a letter about a church age. And look at this very similar statement to the church at Sardis. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come to you like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. How does that make sense for a church age that ended hundreds and hundreds of years ago? And in fact, in six of the seven letters to the churches, a mention of the eschatological return of Jesus is made. As we stated before, how can this be related to historic church ages? They didn't experience the eschatological return of Jesus until they are resurrected. Also, was there ever an entire era of church history where the church was exempt from the hour of testing and in which the Jewish synagogue of Satan came and bowed at their feet, as with the Church of Philadelphia? <laughs> well, obviously not. Also, if this sixth church the Church of Philadelphia truly is the Church of the Rapture, which many claim. Why isn't it the last church age? Why is there another seventh church after it? To those calling our current church age, the Church of Laodicea, which many, many do, which is that seventh church, huh, I guess that means we all miss the rapture. But there are more reasons this theory doesn't fit. Such ages are assumed by each individual writer holding this theory and are totally arbitrary, with nearly every writer giving a different time period for their supposed age. If these seven churches are truly types of church ages, 
They should be unique to that time period so that everyone was pretty much on the same page. But the truth is, all seven types of churches existed in each of the so-called church ages, and they still exist today. There was never a time when one type of church was dominant. And if you happen to believe in the pre-tribulation rapture theory, you cannot also believe in this church ages theory. Did you know that? One cannot believe both. It's either or because they contradict each other completely. I'm sure this is shocking to you, but the pre-tribulation rapture theory teaches something known as the theory of imminence. That not one prophecy has to be fulfilled prior to Jesus' return. Yet, if you believe in this church ages theory, this would have been a prophecy that needed to be fulfilled throughout the last 2,000 years. One cannot believe in imminence, which is necessary for pre-trib rapture theory to be true, and at the same time believe in the prophecy of the seven church ages. They are completely inconsistent. You believe one way or the other. Either there are no prophecies needing to be fulfilled, or all prophecies need to be fulfilled. This brings up another very common theory associated with the pre-trib rapture theory that is related to these seven churches of Revelation, so we'll bring it up here. That common proof is that the church is not mentioned in the book of Revelation after chapter 3 until after the return of Jesus. Proof, some say, of a pre-trib rapture taking the church out of this world prior to the tribulation period, and that is why they say the church is not mentioned. Now, if you do a word search, you find the word church doesn't appear in chapters 4 through 19 of Revelation at all. So is this proof correct? No, it is not. And let me explain why. In the book of Revelation, the word church is never used to refer to the universal church of Jesus Christ. The ecclesia, the assembly of called out ones. It always refers to a specific one of the seven churches, like the Church of Ephesus, the Church of Philadelphia, etc., or it refers to all seven of these churches at one time. It doesn't refer to the universal church throughout the world. So the term church isn't used for the universal church, but for a group of specific churches. When John wants to refer to believers in Jesus, he calls them saints or bondservants. To which some will say, those are only tribulation saints, those that come to faith during the tribulation. But can we make that assumption? Look at these famous verses from chapter 19 of Revelation. The marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. There's the word saints. No one would argue that the church is part of the bride of Christ, yet here the bride adores herself with the righteous acts of the saints. And since this verse is in Revelation, and some want to tell us that the word saints in Revelation are only tribulation saints, are these the righteous acts of tribulation saints only? Is there anyone who believes the bride only adorns herself with the righteous acts of tribulation saints? And that those in the church era don't have righteous acts worthy of the bride? Huh. We know this is nonsense. So when you read the word saints in Revelation, it means believers in Jesus. Those who believed prior to the 70th week and those who became believers after the 70th week. This brings us to one final theory, that the seven churches are present in the 70th week of Daniel, just as we surmise, but that they all coexist at the same time. They're all on the earth at the same time, that every believer on earth finds themselves in one of these, quote, spiritual churches 
that they are types of people, not really assemblies. This theory was proposed by 119 Ministries, whom I happen to really enjoy, and a link to their video is found down in the description if you want to view it at the conclusion of this video. Of all the theories thus far, I like this one the best, but it falls short for three reasons. First, we alluded to it just a moment ago, that each of the seven churches are called churches or ecclesia, the assemblies of called out ones. Saying each individual in the world is divided into one of them defeats this very idea of an assembly, which means they are assembled or collected into one of them. In this theory, they are scattered and divided. Second, is that as we saw, each church is a golden lampstand or menorah. Now in the tabernacle, which Moses built based on God's heavenly standard, there was one and only one lampstand. So how could there be seven all at one time? Now some might argue that these seven are only the lamps on the top of a single menorah or a lampstand, a menorah with seven lamps. But that is not the language used in Exodus when Moses was instructed to make the lampstand. Then you shall make a lampstand of pure gold and you shall make its lamps seven in number, and they shall mount its lamps so as to shed light on the space in front of it. See that you make them after the pattern for them which was shown to you on the mountain. As you just saw in Exodus, there is a strict distinction between lampstands and lamps. And in Revelation, the churches are specifically called lampstands. So either there are seven menorahs all at one time, or there are seven, but entering and leaving the scene one at a time, so that there's only one lampstand on the earth at any given time. I favor that second view because it was the heavenly pattern shown to Moses on the mountain, one and only one lampstand at a time in the tabernacle. And the picture you just saw of the seven menorahs all at one time was very difficult to find because everyone realizes seven menorahs at one time make zero biblical sense. Rather, the artists usually picture it as a single menorah with seven lamps, like this, that we just showed was incorrect. Or the artists picture seven candlesticks. Yet the Old Testament word for lampstand is menorah a seven-branched candlestick. It is obvious John is referring to this, seven menorahs, each with seven lamps, which only makes sense if they enter and leave the scene one at a time. And finally, and most importantly of all, the instructions given to each church are precisely what believers should be doing during each one of the seven seals. The instructions given to Ephesus match those that should be given to believers during the first seal. Smyrna during the second, Pergamum during the third, etc. And this is very precise and in exact order. So our theory is the seven churches are the one and only church of Jesus Christ as it endures and overcomes each of the seals in exact order. What are you going to do when the first seal of Revelation breaks? Is it possible that Jesus gave us specific instructions on how to overcome during each individual year of the 70th week of Daniel? Instructions that have been overlooked and ignored for 2,000 years, but now the church is going to need them. And in this episode, we will begin to reveal those specific directions from the mouth of Jesus himself. For those 2,000 years, the letters to the seven churches have masqueraded as only historic letters to the first century churches that is good advice at any time. And, of course, it is good advice at any time. Others think that perhaps they are prophetic of church ages. However, as we learned in the previous video on the seven churches, they cannot 
be prophetic of church ages, and although they were advice from Jesus to seven first century churches, they carry a prophetic meaning as well. If you missed that crucial initial episode, click on the playlist in the banner or on the link down in the description after this video is over. In that last video, we proposed a shocking theory that each letter is for a specific time period or year of the 70th week of Daniel, so the church can know how to overcome and endure it. As each seal on the seven sealed scroll is opened in Revelation 6 through 8, conditions on the earth will change and change rapidly. These letters instruct the church on how to overcome in the midst of those changes. Now that's just fine for us to say, but since this theory is less than 10 years old and since you have probably never heard it before, I'm sure you'd like some evidence, some proof. So let's show you a brief snapshot of how the events in each seal match up with the instructions in each letter. Then, after demonstrating that, we will begin to look at the amazing details in each letter. But before we begin to look at even the first seal, we need to also remind ourselves that the order and events of each seal in Revelation 6 matches up exactly with the aspects of Jesus's Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24. That is a pattern of seven events in the exact order in both books of the Bible. Deception by false messiahs and prophets, bloodshed, war, and chaos, then economic collapse and famine, followed by abomination and death, then martyrdom, witness and apostasy, celestial signs, and finally wrath. In this previous video from last year, we examined this order and actually uncovered that there were 13 events in exactly the same order. And we discussed the odds of this being random was approximately three trillion to one. So it obviously is not a random order. Now, based on that understanding, let's compare the events of each seal with each letter from 10,000 feet above it. After we look at this generalized comparison, we can begin to dig in to the incredible details that Jesus has placed in each letter. When the first seal opens, its primary focus is on deception by false prophets and messiahs who attempt to spiritually overcome the world. The word for this in Revelation 6-2 is nikao. In your Bible, you may read, he came conquering and to conquer, but the main meaning elsewhere in scripture of this word is overcoming. In the letter to Ephesus, the first letter, we see the church commended for uncovering false religious leaders just like these and for hating the deeds of a group called the Nicolaitans, a word derived from nikao, meaning overcome, just as in Revelation 6-2, and laity, meaning people, the overcomers of the people. Pretty interesting comparison, huh? After the second seal, the world experiences war, rumors of war, struggles between ethnic groups and nations, and peace is taken from the earth. It is also our opinion that this is the year the temple sacrifices begin on a regular basis. In the second letter, the letter to Smyrna, Jesus speaks of martyrdom during this period and also of a blasphemy by Jews who are of the synagogue of Satan. Is this blasphemy the temple sacrifices? We believe it is. After the third seal, we see economic collapse, price fixing, and famine. And in the third letter to Pergamum, Jesus criticizes this church for eating food sacrificed to idols, but offers the faithful some of his hidden manna. Both are economic and famine related issues. After the fourth seal is opened, death is given authority to kill over a quarter of the earth. This is the beginning of the Great Tribulation. In the fourth letter, Jesus promises authority over the nations to those who overcome and threatens to throw some of this church into that same 
great tribulation. After the fifth seal is broken, we see martyrdom, witness, and apostasy. And in the fifth letter, the letter to the fifth church, the letter to Sardis, we see death. It's called the dead church. Now, martyrdom is the physical death of the faithful. Apostasy is the spiritual death of those who fall away. And Jesus instructs the faithful to witness during this difficult part of the great tribulation to strengthen the things that remain. In other words, to strengthen the brothers and sisters still alive who have not yet fallen away or not yet been martyred. After the sixth seal, the celestial signs appear in the sky and Jesus gathers the elect Christians to be with him in what we commonly term the rapture. In the letter to Philadelphia, the sixth letter, Jesus uses the key of David to open the door to heaven and keeps Christians from the hour of testing, which of course is the wrath of God. And this keeping them from the wrath of God is the rapture. After the seventh seal, the wrath of God falls upon the earth. Is there still a church on the earth at that time? Yes, the apostate church. Now the seventh letter, the letter to the church of Laodicea, means trial of the people. And it involves this trial of those without saving faith, those who were not worthy to go with Jesus in the rapture. Jesus tells them he wishes they were hot or cold, but not lukewarm. This phrase is commonly misunderstood, but it means he wishes they were hot and had saving faith or cold and were totally unrighteous and worthy to be destroyed. But as it is, they had some level of faith and thus find themselves in the year of God's wrath. And yet, Jesus knocks on the door and entreats them to still come to true faith before the end. So hopefully after this one minute tour of the seven letters, you can see there is a level of connection between each letter and each seal. Hopefully this has whetted your appetite to learn all the incredible details and connections Jesus has built into these letters, which of course all mimic the seven seals. So without further delay, in this video, let's begin by looking at the letter to Ephesus, the first letter. Just as we mentioned, the first letter is a letter of instruction to the church of Jesus Christ, the one and only church of Jesus Christ, immediately upon the breaking of the first seal of Revelation and the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel. This letter is structured just like all the other seven. First, at the beginning of every letter, we are told the name of the church. And in this case, in the case of the first letter, it's Ephesus. Now, although the meaning of this name is debated, it is generally thought that Ephesus means the desired one. This name reflects the immense spiritual battle that is about to take place on the earth. God and Satan both desire the souls of believers. All of the 70th week of Daniel will revolve around this battle. After the breaking of the first seal, Satan's counterfeit messiahs and false prophets will burst upon the world scene. The conflict for the souls of believers will be between the false messiahs and the true messiah Jesus. Now, in Revelation 6-2, as we learned earlier in this video, the rider of the white horse comes to conquer, which is the Greek word nakao, which literally means to overcome spiritually, to deceive them. The battle lines are drawn for the desired one. At the time John wrote Revelation, Ephesus was the crown jewel of Asia Minor, a rich and highly pagan city. Their economy centered on the worship of Artemis, the moon goddess. For those of you interested in Islamic connections, remember the Islamic god Allah is the moon god. Now Artemis was also the goddess of fertility. She was a huntress and skilled with a bow. 
Recall that the rider of the white horse also carries a bow. The Temple of Artemis was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Many of her worshippers deposited their savings with the priests, trusting that the goddess would protect them. It was an early form of banking. A robust industry of manufacture of Artemis idols supported the town as well. At the center of the Temple of Artemis was her image, a black meteorite that fell to the earth. It's mentioned in the book of Acts. After quieting the crowd, the town clerk said, Men of Ephesus, what man is there, after all, who does not know that the city of Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of the image which fell down from heaven? In my very first book, are we ready for Jesus? We discussed how this very meteorite is likely currently on the Kaaba in Mecca. It is the most holy item in Islam. We also discussed at length that this black stone contrasted with the white stone of Jesus in the letter to Pergamum might possibly be the image of the beast mentioned in Revelation 13. And in a future video, we'll discuss this in more depth. We also learn from Acts that during Paul's time in Ephesus, his teaching so disrupted the trade of idols that a great riot broke out. A silversmith named Demetrius said, Men, you know that our prosperity depends upon this business. You see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a considerable number of people, saying that gods made with hands are no gods at all. Not only is there danger that this trade of ours fall into dispute, disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis be regarded as worthless, and that she, whom all of Asia and the world worship, will even be dethroned from her magnificence. When they heard this, they were filled with rage and began crying out, saying, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! The city was filled with confusion, and they rushed with one accord into the theater, dragging along Gaius and Artistakis, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. Church history relates that Timothy, who was Bishop of Ephesus and the protege of Paul, was martyred by Artemis worshippers, who were chanting this exact same phrase, Great is Artemis. I can almost hear a modern crowd crying out, Allah Akbar, or Greatest is Allah, instead of Great is Artemis when I read this passage. The parallels to Islamic Sharia blasphemy laws seem striking. Will Christians be dragged into city courts for blasphemy against Allah at some point in the 70th week of Daniel? Perhaps. So from the name of the town and from history, we learn that a struggle between the true God and false gods was taking place, much as today's struggle in our modern world. After the church's name, in each of the seven letters, the symbolic attributes of Jesus' appearance are mentioned. In this letter, it is the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands. In our last video, we mentioned that Jesus himself defined what both of these aspects of his appearance meant. We learned the seven stars are the angels of each church. Now, are these human messengers or true angels? We simply aren't told. However, a question favoring human messengers might be, why would Jesus write to angels that stand right before him in heaven? So, I favor human messengers, but I'm not dogmatic about it. Either way, God holds these angels in his right hand. The right hand is the hand of blessing. Israel blessed Ephraim with his right hand in Genesis 48:14. God's right hand is the place of power. Your right hand, O Lord, is majestic in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. Jesus will use these angels to help shatter the deception by his enemies by the revelation of his word. And he will bless these messengers. Huh. 
What an awesome privilege and reward. Notice that in the letter to the church of Ephesus, it stated that Jesus walks among the lampstands. Jesus will be right there with us as we endure and overcome. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Matthew 28, 20. These aspects of Jesus' appearance are appropriate for the first year, since they're kind of introductory. This first year is an entering in to the final act, to the final era of life on earth as we currently know it. And these aspects of Jesus' appearance act as encouragement for all seven years of a 70th week. Now, after Jesus' appearance, each letter then gives the condition of the church. For most of the seven years, Jesus provides both positive and negative feedback. This is what our Lord says will be the positive aspects of the church in the first year of the 70th week of Daniel. I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance, and that you cannot tolerate evil men, and that you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not, and you found them to be false, and you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake, and have not grown weary. The primary condition of the world during that first year of the 70th week will be deception by false messiahs. It appears from this passage that the church is initially able to test and then recognize the false messiahs and false prophets as liars. The Greek word here is pseudius, translated as false, but it means lying or liar. This is the same root word as used in 1 John in this famous verse about the Antichrist, who is the liar, but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. The letter to Ephesus speaks of apostles. So is this passage saying in the future someone will appear claiming to be one of the 12 apostles? I, I don't think so. The word apostle means one sent as an emissary. I think we can assume this is a more generalized meaning as multiple people claiming to be an emissary for God will appear at this time as we know from Matthew 24, four through five, both false prophets and false messiahs. Islam is expecting Isa, who will claim to be the historic Jesus, just not a divine Jesus, but rather a Muslim one. Shia Muslims and Sunni Muslims are each also expecting their own version of the Mahdi, the Muslim savior. And Jews are expecting two messiahs of their own, Messiah ben Joseph and Messiah ben David. Ben Joseph being a suffering messiah and ben David being a kingly one, not realizing. But the one true messiah incorporated both of these aspects. So just imagine the conflict if these five false messiah characters all appeared on the world stage at approximately the same time. Imagine the conflict between them. This is some of what we imagine might take place. And Jesus commends the church, however, for being able to sort these guys out, at least at first, at the breaking of the first seal. Jesus also commends the church of Ephesus for hating the works of the Nicolaitans. Yet this you do have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. In our last video, we discussed this word, Nicolaitans, although there is a lot of conjecture about historic groups that fill this role. The name Nicolaitans appears to be derived from those two Greek words, as we stated earlier, Nikao, meaning overcome, and Lykos, meaning the people. So in combination, overcoming the people. And Christians are not to hate the group. We are to love our enemies but only to hate their actions. And this group is tied to the actions of the rider of the white horse as well, whose conquering in Revelation 6-2 is the Greek word nikao, a spiritual overcoming. By this, we determine the Nicolaitans here 
are followers of the Antichrist, or at least of the false messiahs and prophets, and their deceptive religions, who are attempting to overcome the people of the world, and especially the church. Jesus also commends the church of Ephesus for their perseverance. The Greek word for perseverance is hupomone, which is sometimes translated as endurance. This is the identical Greek word found in Jesus' explanation of the parable of the sower, which is, we are going to find out is critical to understanding Jesus' call for those who have ears to hear that appears at the end of every letter. But the seed in the good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart and hold it fast and bear fruit with perseverance, hupomone. Bearing fruit in the coming trial will require endurance. Additionally, the trial will help produce this type of endurance. We also exalt in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, hupomone. This is one purpose of Daniel's 70th week, the refining of the bride of Christ. Jesus has only one rebuke for the church of Ephesus, but it's a really big one. A real big one. But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first, or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. What is the church's first love? In Matthew, Jesus tells us, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and foremost or first commandment. Bringing those attending our churches back into a love relationship is one purpose of the 70th week of Daniel. Jesus is clear that churchgoers will cease to be the church if they don't repent and act accordingly. They will fall away and apostatize. Entering the trial, the church will do works and will toil. For the Lord says, I know your deeds and your toil. The church will be expending a lot of effort, but it will not be done through the love of Jesus. The effort is running in the wrong direction. Just a few verses later, we learn the church's works are not adequate. Jesus wants the church to do the deeds you did at first. Even though Jesus is aware of the effort of the church, expending in these good deeds, these deeds are not done in the right spirit. So the million dollar question, how does one love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength? Loving God is not only shown through praying, going to a house of worship, praising him with a song, or giving a portion of your income to the church. To love God, it will take more than those religious acts. These are the type of good works that aren't enough that Jesus is talking about in a letter to Ephesus. Loving God is the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit in your life to help you accomplish the things that do produce this type of love. The fruit of the Spirit is love, we are told. And the New Testament actually has quite a lot to say about how he does this. The Holy Spirit empowers believers to be able to keep God's commandments. If you love me, keep my commands. John 14, 15. We need to love the brethren. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, how can he love God, whom he has not seen? 1 John 4, 20. Don't love material things. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 1 John 2.15 And we have to abide in him. God is love. And the one who abides in love abides in God. And God abides in him. By this, love is perfected with us. We love because he first loved us. 1 John 4, 17 and 19. So the Holy Spirit creates a love for God and others 
by our constantly abiding in him. Now the great conflict of the first seal is either loving God or loving the things of the world and Satan's man who provides them, the Antichrist. Those who prepare as Jesus instructs them during this first seal by returning to our first love will be able to overcome all the other seals. Jesus' instructions here are the preparation for the harder trials yet to come. Jesus then concludes his letter with a promise. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Revelation 2.7 Every one of the letters ends with a promise, a promise that is seen fulfilled at the end of Revelation. This particular one is fulfilled in this way. Then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God, and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street, on either side of the river, was the tree of life, bearing twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And the church of Ephesus discovered the false apostles, but in the New Jerusalem we see the true apostles, and the wall of the city had twelve foundation stones, and on them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. We have just seen that the first seal and the letter to Ephesus that is about that first seal are kind of preparatory. But the heat gets turned up with the second seal. Wars, ethnic struggles, and imprisonment of Christians. Let's take a look at it. A year ago, Christians felt pretty safe. But a lot has changed in 2020 and a lot more will change in the rest of 2021. Christians have been lumped together with white supremacists by the media as enemies of the state. So is imprisonment coming and coming quickly? Should we prepare ourselves to face it? So much has been happening in the last month. It is hard to keep up with it. However, it's crucial Christians know what's going on because the government is lumping us together in a group they refer to as domestic terrorists. Watch this clip of John Brennan, former CIA director. So I know looking forward that the members of the, the Biden team who have been nominated or have been appointed are now moving in laser-like fashion to try to uncover as much as they can about what looks very similar to insurgency movements that we've seen overseas, mm -hmm. where they germinate in different parts of a country and they gain strength and it brings together an unholy alliance frequently of religious, ex religious extremists, authoritarians, fascists, bigots, uh, racists, nativists, uh, even libertarians. Did you notice that religious extremists were the number one group on his list. Did you also notice he said the Biden administration is moving with laser-like focus to uncover who these people are, people whom Brennan calls an unholy alliance, frequently of religious extremists, authoritarians, fascists, bigots, racists, and even libertarians. Why are these groups lumped together? because they are the ones who might oppose a totalitarian government, the kind necessary to bring about the Great Reset that you've been hearing so much about on this channel and other channels. If you are not familiar with the Great Reset, the new world order of global elites appears to be planning to crash the economies of the world and then save it by acquiring all the assets, the houses, cars, bank accounts, and businesses of everyone on earth. Then, to control this empire, they will establish a totalitarian government. It is essentially a plan to turn everyone on earth into a compliant slave of the state. In order to make that happen, these groups Brennan mentioned need to be marginalized, probably imprisoned, and maybe even executed if necessary. When the communist governments of Russia and China took power, over 150 million people were killed. Are you among the 100 million Americans or Europeans or Australians 
who are the most opposed to this type of satanic plan of the New World Order. <laughs> if so, think about what they may have in mind for you. If you thought this was impossible a year ago, <laughs> I bet you don't now. But what does the Bible say about such an event? Is there an end time prophecy that predicts the imprisonment of Christians? And yes, there is. It's in the book of Revelation. When Jesus breaks the second seal of Revelation 6, war, bloodshed, and chaos erupt. But when Jesus advises the church, his church, about how to react to the events of the second seal, he gives more detailed instructions about coming poverty, imprisonment, and a mysterious group known as the synagogue of Satan. These instructions are found in Jesus' letter to Smyrna, one of the letters to the seven churches of Revelation, the one that bears an uncanny similarity to what we're expecting will happen during the Great Reset. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you're rich. And the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan, do not fear. What you are about to suffer, behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested. And for ten days you will have tribulation, but be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. This letter speaks of tribulation or persecution. We expect that. It says Christians will be poor, and at the Great Reset, all assets will be taken away. People will become incredibly poor. And it speaks of imprisonment, just as we also expect, and about execution. But why do we think this is future prophecy? Isn't this letter about things that happened in the first century? To put this letter in perspective, in this previous video, we discovered that the letters to the seven churches aren't just historic letters from Jesus to some group of first century churches, but they also carry a prophetic meaning that each letter represents the one and only church of Jesus Christ as it endures and it overcomes each successive seal, probably year, of the 70th week of Daniel. If you want to see evidence on why this is so, there is a link to that video down in the description below the video. Click on it after this video is finished. But what about the Church of Smyrna? This video is about the letter to Smyrna, after all. Smyrna means myrrh, or death. The spice myrrh which was primarily used for embalming, was the main export of the city. Now this letter is about the second seal also, and we know that the second seal initiates a time of bloodshed, war, and chaos. Death is the main export of the second seal, so the name Smyrna fits like a glove. Let's figure out what else about Jesus' instructions to the church fit this seal of death. Some have said the blood of the martyrs becomes the seed of the church. By the time that Revelation was written, emperor worship was a demand, not an option. Churches and individuals were persecuted because they would not burn a pinch of incense and say, Kaiser Curios, Caesar is Lord. In AD 29, seven cities competed for the right to build a temple to the emperor Tiberius. Smyrna was chosen and became the temple warden. That's according to Tacitus. That made refusal to worship the emperor a capital crime in Smyrna. The most famous saint from Smyrna was Polycarp, a disciple of John himself. Polycarp was martyred for his unyielding faith in Jesus by both the apostate Jews, synagogue of Satan, and the Romans. They attempted to burn him at the stake, but the flames wouldn't touch him. Frustrated, the city leaders killed him by running him through with a spear. Although the Great Tribulation does not really begin until the midpoint of the 70th week, the church itself seems to experience tribulation from the second year on. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison 
so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for 10 days. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. We noticed in this passage that many of the faithful will be placed in prison or maybe even in prison camps at this time. The length of time the church will have tribulation, however, is curious. Ten days seems very short. Now, I'm a literalist. I believe most times in the Bible, phrases like that are literal, like ten days means ten days. But here is one that almost has to be symbolic. In the Bible, the most famous 10-day period is Daniel chapter 1, verse 12, the time that Daniel and his friends asked not to eat the king's food and to be tested for 10 days to see if their vegetarian kosher diet would have an ill effect on them. It was a time of testing. In the Jewish calendar of the Feast of the Lord, the days of awe are a 10-day period from Yom Teruah, which is the Feast of Trumpets, until Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. These are the days of repentance. Jewish tradition teaches that those who repent during the days of awe will be written into the book of life. So the meaning of this time seems such a perfect match with the purpose of imprisonment, to be tested. And that is what I think the 10 days is, a symbolic time of testing or repentance or teshuva, which is the purpose of the 10 days of awe repentance. Now, some might think that 10 days should mean 10 years, as in some places a day equals a year in the Bible. I don't think we should apply that here, but you know, who knows? Maybe it does mean 10 years. Western nations have long enjoyed prosperity and religious freedom, yet those are the two things that Jesus tells us are taken away at the second seal. He tells this church that they are materially poor, but spiritually rich. In fact, the Greek word here means to literally have nothing, to be incredibly poor. And isn't this what we expect during the Great Reset? Everything will be taken away. If you read the letters to the seven churches carefully, you'll see a pattern that events of one seal seem to set up events in the next seal. And that is true here. In the third seal, we know that there are famines and food price fixings happening. However, in this letter, we might see what causes those famines. The church becomes poor materially. Perhaps this means a worldwide economic crash and then the Great Reset, just as we've been talking about making everyone a slave of the government, and incredibly poor. And in the midst of the crash and the reset, wars and disturbances occur. That is the meaning of the second seal. Are these disturbances and wars opportunistic as leaders try to seize power while the nations of the world are reeling under the pressure of this economic meltdown, perhaps, or perhaps, they are wars as leaders attempt to resist the New World Order and the Great Reset. In a previous video, we discussed how Vladimir Putin warned the New World Order that moving toward this type of plan will result in the end of civilization. Those are his words. Click on the upper right if you want to watch that video. Certainly, during the Great Reset, peace of mind is taken away from the people of the world, and this is exactly what we learn will happen during the second seal in the Bible. So all this fits perfectly with what we're seeing on the earth right now. How does that lead to imprisonment of Christians? Well, we can only guess, but maybe Christians are blamed for the unrest or for the economic problems, or maybe more likely the New World Order will imprison all of those who have opposed them. This is the purpose of the FEMA camps, we believe, that have been set up all over the U.S., planning in advance to imprison large numbers of Americans. When Jesus told John that some will be thrown into prison, John knew that Roman imprisonment was frequently a prelude to execution, much as it is in places like China today. 
Jesus, however, is clear. This will happen. Yet, he is very encouraging in this letter. In fact, the very first words begin, The first and the last, who was dead and has come to life, says this. This statement, first and last, is a paraphrase of Revelation 1.8, where Jesus claims to be the Alpha and Omega, the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. It is interesting to note that these same two letters in the Hebrew alphabet are the Aleph Tav. These Hebrew letters are used in the very first sentence of the first book of the Bible, Genesis, but they are invisible to English readers. Unfortunately, they're not translated. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In Hebrew, there is an additional word after God, composed of these two letters, Aleph Tav, the first and last letters of the Hebrew alphabet. This is referring to the same person as the Alpha and Omega in a revelation. As he tells us himself, it's Jesus. Jesus created all things at the beginning, John 1, 2, and is in control of all things at the end. In Revelation 22, 13, the two concepts, the first and the last, and the Alpha and Omega are joined in a single verse, showing they mean the same thing. Now, this phrase is highly encouraging to those about to suffer. Jesus created all things and will judge all things in the end. Between the two events, he is in control of everything. Nothing will happen to Christians that he does not work out for their ultimate good. The second phrase, has come to life, is also encouraging Jesus has conquered death. It's not what we should fear. Jesus said, I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body. And after that, have no more that they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear the one who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. That's Luke 12, 4 through 5. Those who have died to Jesus and live in him have nothing to fear, nothing to lose. We are already dead to the old self and to this world and to its evil system. We are alive, however, in him. The Apostle Paul wrote about this as well. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me. And I do not know which one to choose. But I am hard pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Philippians 1, 21 through 24. This should be the attitude of the saints facing the second year of the 70th week. As Jesus told them, and even you and me, possibly, if we live to see it, do not fear what you are about to suffer. And the reason he is he has already overcome the things that will make us suffer. One of the groups that opposes the church of Smyrna during the second seal is the synagogue of Satan. Who is this mysterious group? And who isn't it? Because there's been a lot of misunderstanding about this phrase throughout history. Here is the passage from the letter about the synagogue of Satan. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich and the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews but are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Let's first look at who isn't the synagogue of Satan. Since this letter is primarily a letter from Jesus to the church during the 70th week of Daniel, this is an end time group. The problem is that this phrase has been applied in an anti-Semitic way to Jews living throughout the last 2000 years rather than just to an end time group. It has fostered all sorts of anti-Jew hatred which in turn has helped harden the hearts of the unsaved Jews toward the gospel. 
Another group that this has been misapplied to are those in the Hebraic Roots Movement, Gentile Christians who celebrate the Sabbath. Although some take following the Torah a bit too far and assume it and not Jesus are their source of righteousness, following the commands of God is a good thing, not a bad thing. So now we know who isn't, but who is this mysterious group? They are those who say they are Jews, but are not. Paul alluded to this in his epistle to the Romans. He is not a Jew who is one outwardly, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly. It's a spiritual thing, not a physical genetic thing. Now that poses the question, will the synagogue of Satan really be Jews genetically? And the answer is, from a physical standpoint, likely yes, they will. So what happens in the end times? What sort of blasphemy do these unsaved Jews perform that labels them with this horrible label, the synagogue of Satan? We know from Daniel 9.27 that the Antichrist eliminates sacrifices and offerings at the midpoint of the 70th week of Daniel. So obviously, prior to that time, sacrifices and offerings were occurring. We also know that it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Only Jesus' eternal blood sacrifice will take away sin. So when the Jews begin the practice of temple sacrifices again, it certainly is at the prompting of Satan to take their eyes off the true Messiah who alone can take away sin. God wants his church to know that these sacrifices will be blasphemy and will likely take place during the second seal. What is the other blasphemy this synagogue of Satan will commit? Well, as we just stated, at the midpoint of the 70th week, Satan's emissary, the Antichrist will not only take away sacrifices, but will sit in the temple of God, declare himself God, and demand worship. And he will demand worship from the whole world and kill those who won't worship him. The synagogue of Satan are likely those Jews who follow the Antichrist and adapt their Jewish worship to worship of the Antichrist. We will see this group one more time in Revelation at the sixth letter, the letter to the Church of Philadelphia, the letter about the sixth seal. There we see this proud group, the synagogue of Satan, acting quite differently, bowing down to someone else. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. I will make them come and bow down at your feet and make them know that I have loved you because you have kept the word of my perseverance. So after the sixth seal, when the rapture is about to happen, this group seems to repent and realize their error. We will discuss that further in much more detail when we get to the letter of Philadelphia. In Jesus' letter to the church in Pergamum, which is in Turkey, he said, I know where you live, where Satan's throne is. Satan's throne, you know, is a pretty big deal. Why aren't more people talking about this? Well, we are, and we're starting right now. So what is it about Turkey 2023? Why is that your special? Two reasons. First, it's the 100th anniversary of the Low Sand Treaty. In this previous video, we discussed how the treaty is likely linked to the creation of the Gog-Magog Alliance and the formation of a caliphate, although there is nothing in the treaty that says it expires. Turkey's President Erdogan, the pseudo-dictator of Turkey, is pushing the narrative that it will expire in 2023 and the narrative that it will be time to recreate the Ottoman Empire that that treaty dissolved. Second, it would also be the 
perfect time for Satan's throne to be set back up in Turkey. You need to have this on your spiritual radar. We all do. So today, let's take a deep dive into Jesus's letter to Pergamum and what the throne of Satan was and might still be, and also how it was copied by Nazi Germany and even a U.S. president, and why 2023 is the proposed date for it to be used again. Fascinating stuff. Jesus' instructions to the church of Pergamum starts like this. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. So the death of the martyr Antipas in the first century is a clue to where Satan dwells. Who was this Antipas? Well, we don't know for sure. There is a lot of conjecture, however, that he was the Bishop of Pergamum and that he was killed on the altar of Zeus that used to be in that city. This makes sense as Jesus' letter links Satan's throne with the spot where he dwells and the spot where Antipas was murdered. And although the altar of Zeus isn't in Turkey anymore, it has survived till this day. It's also conjectured that the death of Antipas may have been a human sacrifice. These were usually performed on people who refused to worship the Roman emperor. They were thought to have been offered inside a large bronze bowl, which was heated with fire. When the person had been burned to death, the bones were carved into beads for bracelets to be worn by the pagan priests. These bone bracelets were considered to be holy objects by the pagan Romans. The altar of Zeus is absolutely massive, over 100 feet wide and deep. And the stairway alone that leads up to the altar is over 60 feet high. The base is decorated with sculptures showing a battle between giants and the Olympic gods. Giants are an interesting decoration given the association with them and fallen angels. And I would love your thoughts in the comments about what this might mean. Now that's the ancient history of the altar. In 1878, the German engineer Karl Humann started excavations and took the altar stone by stone back to Berlin. But it was too large to fit any existing museum and it had to have its own museum built just to house it. The famous Ishtar Gate from ancient Babylon is also housed in that same museum. The Berlin Museum opened in 1930 and the altar of Zeus caught the eye of Germany's brand new chancellor, Adolf Hitler who had a replica of it built. Hitler used it for his political rallies and added something the ancient Pergamum residents never dreamed of. He added 150 searchlights aimed up into the sky. He called it the Cathedral of Light. In combination with the torchlight parades, his followers were at stage. It took the appearance of a pagan worship service, Hitler, placed his own podium for speaking at the exact location where the human sacrifices had taken place in the bronze bull. This time, however, the sacrifices took place in concentration camps in the form of 10 million Jews and Christians. We now know this as the Holocaust. Interestingly, that term Holocaust means holy burnt sacrifice, just like Antipas was back in the first century. Now, fast forward to 2008 and the USA Democratic National Convention. The presidential candidate that year, Barack Obama, had his stage made to look just like the altar of Zeus as well. Although Obama did not continue to utilize the altar motif throughout the tenure of his office, like Hitler did, it was no accident that he chose to link the pagan past in the same way as Hitler. His Holocaust probably could be considered the murder of millions of babies through abortion, although he isn't the only U.S. president who is guilty of this sin. Which brings us to 2014. Tajip Erdogan, 
president of Turkey, began to earnestly request the altar be returned to Turkey. Which on the surface is completely reasonable, as it was originally a Turkish artifact. Then something strange happened. The exhibit was closed to the public. Officially, they said it was for restoration. They said it would take five years. And then, when the five years expired, which was in 2019, we were told it would take another four years, expiring in the year 2023. Yes, let that sink in, 2023. That's the exact year Erdogan has been claiming the Lausanne Treaty will expire and that many think he will attempt to use as an excuse to resurrect the caliphate. Does this mean the altar of Zeus, Satan's throne, will be returned to Turkey that year? Well, we don't know, but it certainly seems possible, even likely. And the beast, which I saw, was like a leopard, and his feet were like those of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain and his fatal wound was healed. And the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. This classic verse speaks of Satan's throne being given to the eventual beast empire and the healing of the head of the beast. Now, is Erdogan going to utilize this throne of Satan in the same way that Hitler did in the past, it remains to be seen. As we discussed in the previous video, the healing of the head of the beast is likely the restoration of the caliphate. All Muslims worldwide would then pledge their allegiance to the caliph of any new caliphate. So this might fulfill the whole world following after the beast passage as well. So keeping our eyes on this altar of Zeus around this time is what we all should do. Now the throne of Satan was involved in human sacrifice back in the first century. And Hitler's copy of it certainly seemed to be associated with the Holocaust, the sacrifice of 10 million Christians and Jews. So what type of human sacrifice will be associated with this altar in the future? Possibly the Great Tribulation, the persecution of God's people worldwide. That is definitely something worth keeping our eyes on. Now, what else does this letter to Pergamum tell us about this time? As we have indicated throughout this entire series on the letters to the seven churches, we believe each letter is to the one and only church of Jesus Christ as it overcomes and endures the seals. The first letter to Ephesus is about identifying false prophets, which is what the first seal is about. The second letter is about the beginning of persecution. This third letter to Pergamum has a reference to food. The fourth letter mentions the beginning of the Great Tribulation, just like the fourth seal. The fifth church, Sardius, speaks about the martyrs killed during the Great Tribulation, just like the fifth seal. And the sixth letter, Philadelphia, which you're probably familiar with, speaks of the rapture. The rapture that follows the sixth seal. The seventh seal is the wrath of God. And the seventh letter to Laodicea is about those who are left behind by the rapture to endure the wrath of God. Let's look at this letter in more detail. Here are some of Jesus' instructions. But I have a few things against you, because you have there some who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, to eat things, sacrificed to idols, and to commit acts of immorality. So you also have some who, in the same way, hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. We have theorized that the letter to Pergamum the third letter in a sequence is related to the third seal of Revelation. The third seal in Revelation 6, 5 through 6, is about the fixing of prices of grain and by reference to Matthew 24, to famine. Both are food-related items, and sure enough, 
This letter to Pergamum speaks of food as well. In this case, eating food sacrificed to idols. Now the next letter to Thyatira also speaks of this term, food sacrificed to idols. What does this mean? Now in 1 Corinthians, Paul speaks of this same term, things sacrificed to idols. The things which the Gentiles sacrificed, they sacrificed to demons and not to God. I do not want you to become sharers in demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. What might this food be in the future? What does Revelation tell us about some type of demonic food? And he causes all, the small and the great, and the rich and the poor and the free men and the slaves to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead so that no one will be able to buy or to sell except for the one who has the mark either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Revelation 13, 16 through 17. Although this doesn't mention food directly, obviously food will be a major component of what someone without the mark can't buy. So is the mark of the beast the way those in the end times will eat food sacrificed to idols? Demonic food. It seems that's most likely to me. The passage also mentions the committing of acts of sexual immorality. These two things, eating food linked to demons and sexual immorality, are the two things the letter of Pergamum calls the teaching of the Nicolaitans. And these are the two things which are also called in the next letter, the letter to Thyatira, the teaching of Jezebel. Jesus then promises a couple things, to those who overcome this teaching. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone, and a new name written on the stone which no one knows but he who receives it. This promise of hidden manna is interesting if this letter truly is about the mark of the beast and not being able to buy or sell or obtain food. Is Jesus going to give the churches hidden manna? So does Jesus provide hidden food to those refusing the mark? Well, I don't know. It's a pretty veiled prophecy, but it seems like that might be possible. In terms of the white stone with a new name written on the stone, this has puzzled scholars for ages. In Revelation 19.12, Jesus himself has a name written on him that no one else knows when he rides that white horse to Armageddon. So there's a great deal of similarity here, a white horse, white stone, both having names no one knows except the individual. God has always given people new names. He renamed Abram, Abraham, Sarai, Sarah, and Simon, he renamed Peter. This seems to indicate a new level of relationship to God, but why write it? on a white stone. Well, Islam has a black stone set in the Kaaba. There are those, myself included, that think this stone may be included in the image of the beast. The white stone then may be in contrast to Islam's black stone. The other aspect of this letter is that it twice mentions the sword coming out of Jesus' mouth. Therefore, repent or else I am coming to you quickly, and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. Revelation 2.16 This is the same sword Jesus has coming out of his mouth in Revelation 19.15 when he rides that white horse to Armageddon. Symbolically, Jesus is telling us that those who don't repent will be on the wrong end of that glorious day, and Jesus will be fighting against them. Again, showing this, is absolutely an end time letter. Now we spoke of Turkey 2023. Does this mean that the third seal will break in that particular year? No, that's not what we mean at all. 
We somewhat suspect that the altar of Zeus will return to Turkey that year based on the coincidence of the repair of the altar and Erdogan's desire for a caliphate occurring on that same year. I can absolutely see Erdogan making speeches from that Turkish landmark just like Hitler did. It's just the kind of thing an egomaniac would do. However, this doesn't mean the third seal will open that year. Well, although it might. With the conclusion of the third seal events and the letter to Pergamum, we have completed the preliminary events in the end times. We are now ready to get into the real deal, the fourth seal and the letter to Thyatira. Who is Jezebel, the temptress of the end time church? In Jesus' letter to the church of Thyatira, in the book of Revelation, an intriguing character enters the end time story. Someone or something known as Jezebel. Who is she? How does she tempt the church? And how can Christians be prepared to meet her challenge? By using the name Jezebel to refer to this end time temptress, Jesus who dictated the letter to John, obviously is making a connection to the historic Jezebel, queen of Israel, wife of Ahab, and one of the most wicked women in the Bible. So for us to understand the future Jezebel, we have to understand the historic one because there'll obviously be some links. But before we get into that, we need to be fully convinced that this letter wasn't meant for a historic church back in the first century, but rather is mainly for a future end time church. Jesus makes this statement in the letter. Behold, I will throw her into a sick bed and those who commit adultery with her, I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of her works. This can only be an end time event. The great tribulation only happens in the end times after all. This is the fifth video in a series about the seven letters to the churches of Revelation. In this series, we have discovered that all the letters fit into this category, that they all are letters of instruction to the one and only Church of Jesus Christ. They aren't really seven churches. They're one church as they undergo various trials. These seven letters relate to the seven seals. Each of the letters refers to its relative seal in order. In other words, the first letter refers to the first seal, the second letter refers to the second seal, and this is the fourth letter, so it relates to the fourth seal. These videos are contained in a playlist, and there is a link to it down in the description below this video. If you want to watch them all in order, you can go down there and find it. Now, if we're going to understand Jezebel, we have to understand the entire letter to Thyatira. What does the city's name mean? Commentators are uncertain. It's not a Greek name. Some have proposed that it is a Turkish word. The Turkish equivalent of Thyatira means graveyard on a hill. <laughs> if this is the correct meaning, and I think it is, it fits perfectly with the fourth seal of the 70th week of Daniel the year the green horse rides, signifying death, and thus graveyard. In the introduction to the letter, Jesus describes himself as the Son of God. This is the only reference to this title in the entire book of Revelation. It appears to reinforce the authority of Jesus. At the fourth seal, the Antichrist will sit in the temple of God and proclaim that he is God. He will speak great blasphemies against the Father and the Son, we know that from 1 John 2.22, especially against Jesus' divinity. So this struggle, Christ versus Antichrist, is key to the fourth seal. And this idea is found first in Psalm 2. Now, amazingly, at the conclusion of this letter to Thyatira, Jesus quotes this very psalm. So the letter and Psalm 2 are linked. This psalm is primarily about the fourth seal. But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord, he said to me. You are my son, 
Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will surely give you the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. This psalm is an incredibly important section of scripture in relation to our understanding of the 70th week of Daniel, or some call it the tribulation period. We see God saying he has installed his Messiah, that's Jesus, as king upon Zion. We know that during the fourth seal, which this letter is about, that the Antichrist will take his seat in the temple and proclaim himself as God. So God the Father is essentially saying, oh, no, you don't. You are not king and you are not God. I have a son and his inheritance will be the entire earth and all the nations. Psalm 2 is God's answer to the Antichrist's blasphemous statements. In the letter to Thyatira, Jesus quotes the conclusion of this passage from Psalm 2, but applies it to the church as well. He who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces, as I also have received authority from my father. Jesus' promise to the church is that they will reign over the kingdom of the Antichrist with Jesus in the millennial kingdom, even though authority has been given to the Antichrist for 42 months. That authority will be taken from him and given to Jesus and the saints. This letter is Jesus' reminder to the church that no matter how hopeless the fourth seal looks when that Antichrist assumes control, they are to know how the story ends the saints end up in control. Now, authority is a very important aspect of the fourth seal. From a spiritual perspective, it may be its principal defining aspect. In Revelation 13, we see Satan giving the beast his authority and his throne in this year. And the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. The fourth seal is one of the four horsemen, and God also grants the rider of the green death horse authority to kill in this fourth year. Authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by wild beasts of the earth. So God also grants the beasts authority to wage war with the saints and defeat them. He also grants them authority over every tribe, people, and language. So when Jesus writes that to him who overcomes, he will give authority over the nations, it is this same authority that was originally granted to the beast for the short period of 42 months that Jesus will wrest from him and give it to their rightful owners, the faithful. By the fourth seal, which is the midpoint of the 70th week, Many lukewarm Christians have fallen away during the first three seals. The church, though smaller, is now stronger in their faith and in their deeds due to the refining of the persecution that they've already gone through. Jesus recognizes them for this in the letter to Thyatira. I know your deeds and your love and faith and service and perseverance and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. The final phrase, your deeds of late are greater than at first, is the exact opposite of what was said in the first year in the letter to Ephesus. The fire of trial is refining the church of Thyatira. Jesus does rebuke the church, however, but it's in relation to Jezebel. So who is this Jezebel? Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and she teaches and leads my bondservants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. So, as we said, who is this Jezebel? In prophecy, women are used as symbols to represent religious systems. The woman in Revelation 12 is Israel, maybe Judaism, certainly the New Jerusalem. For example, the passage of Revelation 2 clearly states that Jezebel is a prophetess. She thinks she hears from God, and she teaches this mistaken theology. Jezebel only calls herself a prophetess, however, she isn't one. 
but she leads Christ's bondservants astray by encouraging them to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols and committing acts of immorality. Jezebel herself is not the adulteress, but rather encourages believers to commit adultery. This is an incredibly important distinction that we need to think about. She's not the adulteress. She encourages believers to commit adultery. So what religion is this? We know that it isn't Judaism or apostate Christianity because if they are unfaithful to our Lord, they would be committing adultery. That leaves Islam as the most logical remaining choice. Let's examine the account of Jezebel in the Old Testament to help determine if Islam truly is the religion represented by Jezebel. Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. He married Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and went to serve Baal and worshipped him. Jezebel was the wife of Ahab, who has the dubious distinction of being more evil than all the previous kings of Israel. The text says he began to serve the Sidonian god, Baal. This ancient god was the nemesis of Israel throughout its, in almost its entire existence. So who was Baal? And is there a connection between Baal and the Islamic god Allah? There is speculation that they are the same. Numerous scholars support this theory. Muhammad was from the tribe of Qurashi. Most documents show their principal deity was Hubal that scientists have confirmed was the same deity known in the northern countries as Baal. Other documents show that their principal deity was Allah. Since you can't have two principal deities, many scholars contend that Hubal, Baal, and Allah are really all the same. Even if Baal and Allah are not the same God, it's rather obvious that Jezebel does not symbolize apostate Christianity. The historic Jezebel was a pagan, not an apostate. Let's say that again. It's important to understand. The historic Jezebel was a pagan from Sidon. She was not an apostate Jew. Now that we have come to the conclusion that Jezebel is a symbol for Islam, let's continue to examine the career of Jezebel. Her name means, where is the prince? This was a ritualistic phrase called out by Baal worshippers during times of the year when he was supposedly in the underworld. The phrase would be shouted to usher him onto the earth. To Christians, there is an eerie similarity to the beast that comes out of the abyss. Jezebel also desired the vineyard of Naboth, whose name means fruit producer. She had two false witnesses accused Naboth of blasphemy and then had him stoned to death in order to acquire his vineyard. Isn't this also a perfect picture of the persecution to come when the Antichrist will accuse the faithful fruit producing believers of blasphemy against Allah or Baal and then take all their possessions? Back in the days of Jezebel, Elijah caused no rain to fall for three and a half years. After God said he would restore rain to the land, Elijah challenged the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. In this famous confrontation, Elijah mocked the Baal prophets. After God caused fire to fall from heaven following Elijah's prayer, Elijah had the Israelites kill the 450 prophets of Baal. I anticipate that confrontations between God's two witnesses, one of whom likely will be Elijah, during the Great Tribulation and the Antichrist will mirror this type of confrontation. We also saw in the letter to Thyatira that Jezebel is going to lead churchgoers astray so that they eat food sacrificed to idols. It's interesting that the Islamic system of halal, sacrificing and preparing meat for food, is a sacrifice to their god, Allah, whom we know to be an idol. Additionally, 
In the last section, we learned how all food eaten. Additionally, we know that all food eaten under the system of the mark of the beast can be considered food sacrifice to this idolatrous religion as well. The sexual immorality mentioned may be physical, as Islam is a religion that accepts the ideal of sexual slavery, and Christians might even be enticed into that horrible system. Or it may simply be spiritual unfaithfulness, as believers fall away and commit apostasy rather than face death. I am not 100% sure which one of these it is, or maybe it's even both. Jesus will begin to punish the false religion of Islam with pestilence in the fourth year as well. I gave her time to repent, and she does not want to repent of her immorality. Behold, I will throw her in a bed of sickness, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of her deeds. And I will kill her children with pestilence. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. It says that Jesus has allowed Jezebel, Islam, time to repent. Most scholars date the beginning of Islam with the writing of the Quran back in uh, about 609 AD. Jesus has given Jezebel, or Islam, 1400 years to repent. But at some point, Jesus' long-suffering patience with Islam is about to end. We then see that Islam and her children will be thrown onto a bed of sickness. Jesus specifically says he will kill her children with pestilence and that this will be cause for all the churches to know that Jesus is the one who searches minds and hearts. In our opinion, this implies that the pestilence just about has to be supernatural in origin and will specifically target Muslims. That's how the churches know <laughs> that it's coming from Jesus. Psalm 91 states the following related to this pestilence. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not approach you. You will only look on with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. For you have made the Lord your refuge, even the most high your dwelling place. No evil will befall you, nor will any plague come near your tent. The passage in Revelation 2 says that those that commit adultery with Jezebel, Islam, will be thrown into great tribulation. The passage specifically differentiates between those who commit adultery with Islam and her children. Her children are killed by the plague. To me, those who commit adultery with her are not those who necessarily convert to Islam. Those are her children. Rather, they are those who do not actively oppose Allah, and they seem to accept some of Islam's practices. Jesus is clear that those people, Christians and non-believers alike, should not be fooled. They will not escape the wrath of Islam. Remember, the Great Tribulation is the wrath of the Antichrist and his followers. It's not God's wrath and they will be thrown into great tribulation by God. In other words, they will still be persecuted unto death. Their passivity will not save them from the great tribulation. This is a very misunderstood passage. We need to go over it just one more time. So the great tribulation is the wrath of the Antichrist and his followers. Those who passively accept it at first may think they're going to escape the Great Tribulation, but God says, uh-uh, they will also be persecuted unto death. Their passivity and reluctance to object to Islam will not save them from the Great Tribulation. Jesus then addresses those who remain true to the faith, but I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I place no other burden on you. Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. 
He who overcomes, and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. We have now circled back to the promise of Jesus' authority being given to the saints. But carefully notice what the passage says. Hold fast until I come. He who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give. Jesus makes this promise only to those who endure until the end. This implies that a significant trial is coming in which believers will have to hold fast. And the next letter, the fifth letter about the fifth seal, the letter to the church of Sardis, describes this very thing, the great tribulation. This letter to Sardis isn't about a dead church, as so many Christians believe, but rather is a letter of instruction to those who are about to be martyred in the Great Tribulation. Till then. The Church of Sardis in Revelation are the martyrs of the Great Tribulation, the fifth seal. Jesus' letter to the Church of Sardis in Revelation is one of the most misunderstood epistles in the Bible. Rather than being written to a dead church, as today's world wants us to believe, Instead, it is about the martyrs alive during the Great Tribulation, during the time of the fifth seal. It is Jesus' instructions to those enduring that most difficult time. Jesus is pretty clear that this letter is not to a dead, faithless church any old time in the last 2,000 years, but rather is specifically written to those who will see him return on the clouds. Did you know that? Let's look and how we can know this. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. This is a pretty amazing passage that we will continue to look at later in this video, but right now, what is most interesting is how Jesus says he will come like a thief to those who don't wake up. Coming like a thief is something that can only happen to those still alive, at the return of Jesus. Those who died years ago can't have Jesus come like a thief to them. This clearly places the letter to Sardis as applying to those living during the 70th week of Daniel, or as some call it the tribulation period. It isn't a universal letter. It's a letter to an end time church. This is the sixth video in a series about the seven letters to the churches of Revelation. In this series, we have discovered that all the letters fit into this category, that they're all letters of instruction to the one and only Church of Jesus Christ as they undergo various trials. These seven letters relate to the seven seals. Each of the letters refer to its relative seal in order. In other words, the first letter refers to the first seal, the second letter to the second, etc. Now, this letter is the fifth letter, and it relates to the fifth seal, as you will see. The videos that we just talked about are all contained in a playlist, and a link to this is down in the description below this video if you want to watch them all in order. So now we know who it was written to, let's explore the letter. The name of the city, Sardis, is derived from the semi-precious gemstone, Sardius. A Sardius stone is white with red streaks within it which is very appropriate for the martyrs of the fifth seal, those martyred in the Great Tribulation. They are white or pure, and they're then martyred, which is the red streaks in the stone. Jesus refers to the color white in this letter. Yet you still have a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. This clothing, white garments, is consistent throughout the book of Revelation. It is a consistent theme or sign for the transformation into resurrection bodies. In this letter to Sardis, the white garments are promised to the church. In Revelation 6.11, they are given the white garments, but told not to put them on just yet. 
In Revelation 19, 7 through 8, we see the church putting on the garments. Then, in Revelation 9, we finally see the saints wearing the garments and standing before the throne of God. After this, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. There are several distressing aspects of these white garments in these verses. First, in the letter to Sardis, we saw that there were only a few at the fifth seal who won't have soiled their garments. And remember, this is a church. So, just like the parable of the ten virgins, where half of them are foolish virgins, here again, Jesus is telling us that only a few are saved at the time of the Great Tribulation. Most have their oil run out of their lamps, and they will fall away from the faith. They soil their garments. This is the great apostasy Paul spoke of in 2 Thessalonians 2.3. In that verse, he calls it the apostasy. Apostasy is something that's occurring right now. But it isn't the apostasy, the one that takes place during the Great Tribulation, the unmistakable final apostasy. What we're facing now is just common apostasy, people walking away from the faith, but not in numbers so great that no one can deny it is the apostasy. When faced with the choice of dying a martyr's death for Jesus or committing this apostasy and worshiping the Antichrist, Jesus is telling us a vast number in the church today will turn away from the faith and all within a very short time. This is what Jesus was talking about when he said, remember then what you received and heard, keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come to you like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Jesus said he will be coming against these former churchgoers when he returns. He can only be against them if they fell away from the faith. So the church of Sardis is a dead church in two ways. Many in the church will physically die a martyr's death and many will choose to die spiritually instead and walk away from the faith. Two forms of death. And for most, it will be one or the other. And the number of those who die for their faith is preordained. Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. When we sing the song, when the saints go marching in, we sing, Lord, I want to be in that number when the saints go marching in. Unfortunately, most churchgoers aren't imagining <laughs> that that number might be the number of martyrs that are preordained in this verse. However, it is interesting that this great division in the church between the martyrs and those in apostasy isn't obvious to the world around them. Look what Jesus has to say. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. The reputation in the world is that this is still a church. I find that very interesting. But it's a church in which most have rejected Jesus as the Son of God. I think this is telling us something about the Great Tribulation. It's giving us a clue. It's telling us that there will still be churches during the Great Tribulation, except the people in them will not be worshiping Jesus as the Son of God. They will be worshiping the Antichrist in their same churches, possibly still called Christians. I find that very interesting, and it might be something that you want to make some comments about down in the comments section. This brings us to Jesus' instructions to those who are still alive. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. God has a special job for these Christians. 
he specifically says that their works are not yet complete in his sight. The task of those who wake up to the reality that they are now in the great tribulation is that they are to strengthen those who are about to die. What does God mean by this? Well, for one, those who are awake are to strengthen those others about to lay down their lives for Christ, to encourage them and build up their faith, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near, there will be great temptation to hide in the last days when you see the day drawing near. As the world is going to begin to hunt down Christians, but we are to assemble together and encourage one another regardless. The second way those who are awake can strengthen those about to die is to strengthen those about to commit apostasy. Those about to die spiritually. The true believers can do this by being role models of courage in the face of death. It's likely that many will die in public executions. They will be asked to either pledge allegiance to and worship the Antichrist or die. Those who choose death will give strength to those still in line, waiting to be asked that inevitable question. If everyone in line gives in to the Antichrist, it will be harder for, to resist him. But if several courageous saints choose martyrdom instead, it will strengthen those still on the fence. So during the Great Tribulation, the task of Christians still alive is to strengthen those in their churches. One can't do that if they're hiding. That is something key to understand about the Great Tribulation. And Jesus calls those who sacrifice in this way the ones who overcome. Jesus says how they will be rewarded as well. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. This is exactly what he preached during his earthly ministry. I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body, and after that have nothing more they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. And I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man will also acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. Again, Jesus ties being acknowledged before God as being willing to lay down your life. Jesus wants churchgoers to know it is very important to not think that we will escape our times. Rather, the Bible is so clear over and over and over again in the Gospels and in Revelation that Christians should be prepared to die for their faith. Maybe you won't have to, but we need to be prepared to do so. The fifth seal describes a very difficult time that Christians will undergo, but the sixth seal talks about that moment when relief finally comes, when Jesus keeps the church from the hour of trial. Now, what does that mean? That controversy focuses around the issue of the rapture. Is it pre-trip, pre-rap, post-trip? Is there any rapture at all? This letter to Philadelphia has a lot to say about that issue. And we promise that we will tell you more. If you just watch to the end of the video, you'll get details you've not seen before. The first question is, who is the Church of Philadelphia? If it was simply a church in southeastern Pennsylvania, well, everybody would move there and become Philadelphia Eagle fans. That's an inside American football joke. But that's not it. We know that. But we have to know who the promise is for. But first, let's read that promise. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. There are a couple theories who it is. The primary theory is that all seven of the letters to the churches in Revelation are just historical letters to churches back in the first century that happen to give good advice that's good advice all the time, back then and now. This makes the letters 
modern pastor's favorite part of Revelation to teach from. The second most popular theory is that the letters are church ages, ages that reflect changes in the universal church over the last 2,000 years that existed. But in this landmark former video, we prove that neither of these theories are completely correct, and especially in regard to this promise to the Church of Philadelphia. The link for this video is down in the description, and you can watch it when this one is done. Let's consider if the letters to the seven churches were only historic, back in the first century. <laughs> then this promise means nothing. It would only be a tiny, historic church that Jesus was telling would be kept from a trial. But yet notice, the trial was supposed to affect the whole world. So that just doesn't make any sense. Additionally, what is very interesting is the difference between Jesus' letter in Revelation and a letter from the church father, Arrhenius, to this same church, the Church of Philadelphia. Jesus speaks of his church in glowing details, doesn't criticize them at all, while Arrhenius takes them apart, criticizing the church for numerous ways they were disobeying the way of Christ. So if the letter from Jesus was only to this ancient church, then why is it different than the one Arrhenius sent them? Second, if the letters are church ages, then this promise belongs to the sixth church age. An age, those believing in this theory, thinks has already passed. And if that is true, then this passage about a promise to be kept from the hour of trial also means nothing today, as most of those churches are boarded up and long forgotten. So if the promise in this letter means anything at all, we can pretty much assume the letter to Philadelphia in Revelation 3 refers to Christians during the end times, and this trial is some sort of end time trial that the world goes through. And this fits perfectly with our theory that all seven letters to the churches of Revelation were written to advise the one and only church as it overcomes each of the seven seals, each in order. The first letter, Ephesus, is about the first seal and false prophets. The second letter, Smyrna, is about the beginning of persecution. The third, the letter to Pergamum, is about Satan's throne, the mark of the beast, and the end-time famine. The fourth letter, Thyatira, is about the abomination of desolation, end-time pestilence, and the start of the Great Tribulation. And the fifth letter, is about the fifth seal and the martyrdom of the saints during the Great Tribulation. That brings us to the sixth letter. It brings us to Philadelphia. So today we're doing a deep dive on this letter to Philadelphia to answer all three questions we posed at the beginning about the hour of trial. And we're going to use scripture to interpret scripture because questions like this aren't something we should just guess about. That's important to you consider joining us by subscribing. So let's leave all our preconceived notions about what this letter is about at the door and see what scripture says. The letter begins with this description of Jesus. He who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut and who shuts and no one will open. So Jesus has the key of David and is in charge of who comes in and who goes out of this door that the key fits. But where is the door? And where do the people go? Well, Revelation mentions a door four times. In this one, in the letter to Philadelphia, it's an open door. I have put before you an open door, which no one can shut. In the very next letter, the letter to Laodicea, the door is shut. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him. In the next chapter, the door is opened for the Apostle John to enter heaven, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here and I will show you what must take place after these things. 
and in Revelation 19, and I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. So there is obviously a door in heaven that Jesus, the Apostle John, and the saints will go in and out of. This is the same door Jesus referred to in the parable of the ten virgins. The bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Later, the other virgins also came, saying, Lord, Lord, open for us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. The parable shows us how the door is used. The wise virgins enter the wedding feast by means of this door. And it is then shut on the foolish virgins who pound on the door to let them in. But it is too late. This is the door which Jesus controls. And he uses the key of David, which is referred to in the Old Testament in Isaiah 22. Now this passage refers to an ancient political scandal where the key of David was taken away from an unscrupulous administrator named Shebna and given to a righteous new administrator named Elakim. And we know this is the passage that is to be applied to Jesus as the righteous administrator because the quote is the same as Revelation uses, I will set the key of the house of David on his shoulder. When he opens, no one will shut. And when he shuts, no one will open. Interesting. Shebna means he who is over the house. And Elikim means God rises. A very fitting title for a man who would symbolize the Messiah. The passage shows symbolically the authority of Satan over the grave that was taken from him and given to Jesus at the cross. This is the power of that key. Jesus said, I was dead and behold, I am alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and Hades. So why are we spending so much time about a key? About this topic, you might be asking, when the video is about the hour of trial. The reason is because we cannot understand the hour of trial if we don't understand the context of the letter of Philadelphia. The letter is all about the rapture and the opening of the door of heaven for the wise virgins who are the church of Philadelphia. Now, from all our other videos that we've done on this topic, you know that the rapture happens after the sixth seal. That is why this letter is the sixth letter. Jesus opens the door of death and Hades, resurrects the righteous dead, and they are caught up together with the church of Philadelphia in the air to meet Jesus and to go through the door of heaven. This helps us understand what the meaning is behind the name Philadelphia and why this very tiny church was chosen to symbolize the remnant who survives in order to be raptured. The name Philadelphia famously means city of brotherly love. <laughs> why? Well, after enduring the first five seals, which includes the persecution of the Great Tribulation, the remaining believers would be a tight-knit group. All the betrayers would have long since left, and all denominational differences would be long forgotten. They would finally have brotherly love for each other, the kind we only dream about in our churches today. So this helps us identify what the hour of trial means. Every rapture position, pre-trib, pre-wrath, post-trib, considers it to be the wrath of God. Pre-trib, of course, think the wrath of God is the entire 70th book of Daniel. Pre-wrath feel it's the time after the sixth seal until Jesus returns and post-trib have many different conceptions of that. Probably the main one is it is simply the day of the Lord at the very end of the 70th week. But every one of these positions believe the hour of trial is that period of time. They just differ on how long that period is. Now, interestingly, this letter to Philadelphia has other details in it that tend to help us identify how long that wrath of God period might be, at least relatively, and which one of those rapture theories 
might be correct. So you want to keep watching till the end so you can catch these details. In this letter, we also learn about the synagogue of Satan, that mysterious group who was also seen in the letter to Smyrna. But in this letter, they bow at the feet of the church of Philadelphia. This is a key understanding. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews, but are not, but lie. I will make them come down and bow at your feet and make them know that I have loved you. Who is this synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews, but aren't? Since this is an end time application, our assumption is they are those who did sacrifices until the Antichrist took them away and then worshiped the Antichrist. They will bow eventually at the feet of the Church of Philadelphia. This shows a number of things. First, this is something that has never happened in history. Again, showing that this has to be a future event. Second, this won't happen pre-tribulationally or frankly, any time during the 70th week of Daniel until Jesus returns. Those worshiping the Antichrist will not bow before Christians until they see the proof of Jesus' love for them, which is when every eye on the planet sees him and the rapture event follows. Only then will they bow. So this context teaches us a lot. But the letter is almost assuredly about the rapture and that it is just as assuredly not about a pre-tribulation event because otherwise the synagogue of Satan wouldn't be bowing knowing that Jesus loves the church. That doesn't happen until Jesus appears in the air. Which brings us back to the passage you clicked on the video in the first place to learn about being kept from the hour of trial. But now that we know the context of the letter of Philadelphia, we're ready. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. There is going to be a trial, and the ones going on trial are those who dwell on the earth. We learned in this video about the letter to the church of Laodicea the very next letter in Revelation, that the name Laodicea itself means trial of the people. So the trial is what that church endures, the church that is left behind. But what about those who dwell on the earth? They would be contrasted with those who dwell in heaven. At the separation of the righteous from the wicked, the righteous enter the door of heaven and are saved. The wicked continue to dwell on the earth. And that is exactly how John and Jesus use this term. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus uses almost the same explanation. Be on guard so that your hearts will not be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness from the worries of life. And that the day, he means the day of the Lord, will not come upon you suddenly like a trap. For it will come upon all those who dwell on the face of the earth. There it is, the earth dwellers. But keep on the alert at all times, praying that you may have the strength to escape all these things that are about to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. Notice, those who dwell on the earth are different than those who escape. They are two different groups. And in addition to Revelation 3.10, those who dwell upon the earth is used in Revelation eight more times to describe the unrighteous. In Revelation 6.10, 8.13, 11.10, 13.8, 13.12, 13.14, and 17.8. You should check these out. They are quite interesting references. Those who dwell upon the earth are not everyone. It's those who are left behind. This helps interpret the entire book of Revelation. Now, let's start digging into the controversial issues. Is the escape from the hour of trial pre-tribulational, pre-wrath, or post-trib? 
let's look at the reason Jesus gives for keeping the church of Philadelphia out of the trial. Because you have kept my word of patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial. It's a conditional statement. The rescue requires them to have had patient endurance. Our English Bibles translate a single Greek word as patient endurance. And this word appears six other times in Revelation every single time. It refers to Christians patiently enduring persecution. Here is one example. If anyone is destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone kills with the sword, with the sword he must be killed. Here is the perseverance, that's the word, and faith of the saints. And here is another. If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of a lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day and night. Those who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the perseverance, there's the word again, of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. Both passages refer to the great tribulation. This fits perfectly with the model of the seven churches we have presented in this series, saying this one, the letter to Philadelphia is about the rapture that happens after the sixth seal, after the great tribulation. Thus, these saints will have endured the great tribulation, and it is their ability to patiently endure it with the assistance of the Holy Spirit that keeps them from the trial. The hour of trial is only coming on the wicked. The righteous are kept from the hour. Now, hour is a time period. They are not protected from the trial. They are protected from the time period of the trial. That's a subtle but very important difference. The righteous are kept for the entire time of the trial. They are removed from it. There are those who will say, Christians, they're only protected from the trial, but they still remain on the earth. But this verse says everyone left on earth endures the trial. So if someone is kept from it, they must be removed from the earth. This is a very key point to understand. Okay, so how long is an hour? It's the hour of trial. I think everyone realizes it isn't 60 minutes, so how long is it? The word hour appears 11 times in Revelation, three times it appears with a number, either one hour or a half hour. This means a specific length of time. However, eight times, it's called the hour or that hour, which means the specific time something starts. And that's what it means here. It is the hour the trial starts. It isn't a specific code for how long the wrath of God is. With the letter to Philadelphia, the sixth seal, we learn that relief comes to a portion of those attending our churches, but not to everyone. Some are left behind. What happens to them, the ones that remain on the earth? We find out about that in the seventh seal and the letter to Laodicea. Hi, this is Nelson, and despite what our modern Christian culture teaches about the assurance of everyone who said the sinner's prayer going with Jesus at the rapture, Jesus himself paints a very different picture in the Gospels, just as the apostles do in the epistles and John in Revelation. Many of Jesus' parables and sermons speak of this separation of the righteous from the wicked, but the wicked are not who you imagine. They aren't the idolaters, adulterers, or murderers. In the parable of the ten virgins, all ten virgins are looking forward to the return of the bridegroom. And they're virgins trying to keep themselves pure. All ten light their lamps. 
but only half get into the wedding feast. In the parable of the wheat and the tares, the weeds look identical to the wheat who represent the truly saved. That means they look just like you and me. And it isn't until the harvest that the reapers who are angels know who's who. Even angels don't know right now. Yet the weeds are left behind to be burned when the wheat is taken into the barn. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus instructs that those who hear his words, yet don't put them into practice, will have their house destroyed. Those who hear his words today are those attending our churches. It's those sitting right next to us. This warning occurs in the same portion of Scripture where he gives this other incredible warning. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven, will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. If you notice, Jesus rarely spoke of those who were obviously unrighteous, but rather focused primarily on the group that heard his words. Those hearing them in those days and those hearing them in our churches today. Those who heard his words and did them are the saved. But those who didn't act on them are the foolish virgins, the tares, the foolish builders, building on the sand. In Revelation, Jesus wrote to this group in the letter to Laodicea. Jesus tells us the things that won't save. Calling Jesus Lord alone won't save. Doing amazing works in his name won't save. I mean, I have never cast out demons or prophesied in his name. Have you? But notice one thing condemns all these people. They practice or continually do unrighteous acts or lawlessness. Let's keep that in mind. In that letter, Jesus said, I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. Because you are lukewarm and neither hot or cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Jesus says there are three groups of people based on their faith and deeds that they do. The hot, who are truly saved, who hear Jesus' words and do them. The cold, who are worldly and unrighteous, who want nothing to do with Jesus. And a third group, the lukewarm. And although this group was a primary focus of Jesus' teachings, we rarely hear about them from our pulpits. This last group, the lukewarm, are the tares, the foolish virgins, the foolish builders, those who hear Jesus' words and yet don't put them into practice. They sit next to you and me in church on Shabbat and Sundays. They may be in your small group, they may be in your own family, or you may be lukewarm yourself. That's what makes this teaching critical to understand. And Jesus promises to spit them out of his mouth. The Greek word in the original text actually implies he will vomit them out of his mouth. <laughs> Pretty dramatic words from the Holy Son of God. But why does Jesus desire that they were either hot or cold? How does that even make sense? Why would Jesus prefer that they were unrighteous to being lukewarm? Well, the hot obviously deserve their reward, and the cold obviously deserve their punishment. They have lived their lives in opposition to Jesus. But the lukewarm didn't live in outright rebellion. They attended church, they heard sermons, and they thought they'd be raptured. They thought they were saved, but they weren't. So today we're doing a deep dive into the letter of these lukewarm Christians, the Church of Laodicea, and we'll examine the whole idea of cheap grace and how a person can attend a church and have said the sinner's prayer and still be absolutely lost. That's a pretty important topic, a super important topic actually, one you may never have heard of. But on this channel, we tackle tough topics like this by letting scripture interpret scripture. If that's important to you, consider joining us by subscribing. Let's start, however, with the idea of why the letter to Laodicea is to those left behind at the rapture. I fully understand that most of you think the letter to Laodicea is either historic or only speaking of our modern 21st century society. 
The answer, however, is it's all three, with the primary fulfillment being the one in the future, after the rapture. That's the true focus of the letter. In this previous video, we discussed in detail all the reasons that the letters to the seven churches of Revelation are all future prophecies, instructions to Christians enduring each of the seven seals of Revelation. The letter to Ephesus is about false prophets, the first seal. Smyrna is about the beginning of persecution, the second seal. Pergamum, about the return of Satan's throne and the mark of the beast, the third seal. Thyatira is about the abomination of desolation, the end time pestilence and the beginning of the great tribulation, the fourth seal. Sardis is about the martyrdom of the saints in the great tribulation. And the famous letter to Philadelphia is about the rapture that takes place after the sixth seal. The final letter then is about those church goers who don't go with Jesus in the rapture, the church of Laodicea. And in this video playlist, we will include or already include videos on all these topics. And the link to the playlist is down in the description if you want to investigate. However, this video focuses on those left behind, the church of Laodicea. You may ask why Laodicea is called a church at all if its parishioners are left behind at the rapture. The reason is they were church goers. There is a difference between a pew sitter, a church goer, and a true Christian. But they all attend the same church. So before we look at Laodicea and Jesus' instructions to the church left behind, we need to take a moment to think about the bigger topic, which is what constitutes being saved. Is it just saying a prayer once in your life and then acting like the world around us for the rest of a person's life? Here's what the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association says about how a person is saved. We can't earn salvation, and I agree. We are saved by God's grace when we have faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. Agreed. All you have to do is believe you are a sinner, that Christ died for your sins, and ask His forgiveness. Then, turn from your sins. That's called repentance. That is faith, belief, combined with a turning from your sin. The problem many of our modern Christian culture churches have is they leave off the final part, the turning from sin. Grace is free, but it wasn't cheap. It cost the life of the most perfect Son of God. Yet many treat that sacrifice as if it was just some kind of get-out-of-jail-free card. Say a prayer, get out of punishment of hell forever but that's not the way it is. The writer of Hebrews, whom some think may have even been Paul, had this to say, For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. So those who go on in their previous sin even after saying a sinner's prayer, can expect the fury of fire, the wrath of God. This is a crucial passage of Scripture, and it continues. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severe punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and insulted the spirit of grace. Those who don't turn from sin insult the salvation of our Lord. Now this passage doesn't say we can never sin and be saved, but rather that if we willfully go on sinning in a perpetual pattern, then we were always unsaved. John had this to say, if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So John says, all of us sin and Jesus will forgive us. His blood has the power to save. But he forgives us if we repent. Notice that caveat. That passage is famous, but about three verses later we read this. By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. 
The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him, but whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. Only those who keep the commandments are in Christ. Now ask yourself, how many Christian churches today are teaching this? Not many are there. And the reason might be that it's a whole lot easier to sell cheap grace than it is to sell a grace that requires repentance. And this is the reason there is a letter to Laodicea, a letter to churchgoers who are left behind. They may have believed that Jesus was the Son of God and died for the sins of all, but they didn't have the faith to act on it when the chips were down. Here's what Jesus' brother James says, even so faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. James is clear that belief alone doesn't save, that even the demons believe in God and Jesus. One can't just pray a prayer and think you're saved without demonstrating a changed life. Real faith is living out what we believe. Stephen Curtis Chapman, the Christian singer, put it this way. I've got little Bible magnets on my refrigerator door and a welcome mat to bless you before I walk across my floor. I got a Jesus bumper sticker in the outline of a fish stuck on my car. And even though this stuff's all well and good, yeah, I can't help but ask myself, what about the change? What about the difference? What about the grace? What about forgiveness? What about a life that's showing I'm undergoing the change? Unfortunately, it's much easier for our modern churches to sell a cheap grace, as we just said, one that can have salvation without a change. And that is exactly what many of our churches are doing. And that may be why Jesus indicates that 50% of those watching for his return, the foolish virgins, won't be going with him in the rapture. Those folks are the ones Jesus wrote to and about in the letter to the church of Laodicea. So now let's dig into that letter. Jesus' previous letter in Revelation, the sixth letter, the letter to Philadelphia, concludes with a famous passage about avoiding the hour of trial. You probably know this passage. Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I will also keep you from the hour of trial, that hour which is about to come on the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. There is a lot of controversy about what this trial is, but what very few realize is that the letter of Laodicea was written to those undergoing that trial. In fact, Laodicea means trial of the people. They are those undergoing the trial, those who are not kept from it. And Jesus is the star witness. The amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of creation of God says this. He testifies that the foolish virgins of the church of Laodicea never knew him. We read that twice in the Gospels, in Matthew 7.23 and Matthew 25.12. But Jesus is also their defense counsel. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed and I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. So the wrath of God time period is a time of trial for those who are lukewarm. This means that they still have a chance to repent. Those left behind can still be saved and later in Revelation, we see direct evidence of this. Immediately prior to the return of Jesus to rapture the wise virgins in Revelation 14, a voice from heaven booms across the earth. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, said the Spirit, so that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds will follow them. It is immediately after this that Jesus comes on a cloud and harvests the earth resurrects and raptures the righteous. That is found in Revelation 14, 14 through 16. 
So those who are resurrected and raptured aren't those who are going to die in Christ from then on. They've already been resurrected and raptured. It must be somebody else. Obviously, it's those who are left behind. They then can still repent and still be saved. In the letter to Laodicea, Jesus reinforces this idea. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and I will dine with him and he with me. What I find very interesting in this passage is the door, the door of heaven. In the parable of the 10 virgins, Jesus takes the wise five virgins through the door and into the wedding feast in heaven. But here in this passage, Jesus is offering to come back through the door to those in Laodicea and dine with them on the earth. Those left behind can still be saved, but they have lost their chance to enter heaven and spend time with the Father before his throne. Jesus concludes this letter speaking about this very throne. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my Father on his throne. So obviously there are two thrones, a heavenly one that the Father sits upon and an earthly one that Jesus will sit upon on the earth. And that is all the Laodicean church has promised. They will rule and reign with Jesus upon the earth if they overcome, but never enter heaven with the Father. They missed that opportunity when they were left behind at the rapture. This idea of those left behind at the rapture, however, <laughs> creates all kinds of questions. For instance, how long is the period after the rapture? This hour of trial that the foolish virgins endure. What events happen during that period? The answers are stranger than you think. Most Christians have no idea. If you want to keep watching and find out, well, click right here to learn about the steps Jesus takes in his victory over the world and in the redemption of the foolish virgins. It's their last chance. Till then, this is Nelson, and I'll see you there.